On this worksheet, we're going to solve a few different problems related to chirality centers. As a reminder, a chirality center is a carbon atom that has four single bonds, and every one of those single bonds is to something unique. So I'm just going to say A, B, C, D here. Uh, every, every bond is to something entirely different. In order to be a chirality center, you have to be a carbon atom and you absolutely must have four single bonds. So the first problem that we're looking for or looking at, we're trying to find chirality centers in each one of these molecules. And it's possible that their molecule might have more than one or that it might not have any. So first thing um, that we're gonna do is recognize all of the different carbon atoms in the molecule. I'm just gonna put some dots on them. Those are all of our possible chirality centers. Then what I like to do next is just kind of think about how many hydrogen atoms are on each one of the carbon atoms. For example, this carbon atom out here on the end has three hydrogen atoms attached to it. And because it has three hydrogen atoms, it has three of the exact same thing. It doesn't meet this criteria of having four unique things and so there's no way that this could be a chirality center. And for our um, carbon on the other end of the molecule, this is the exact same situation. We have three hydrogen atoms on there, and so therefore it also cannot be a chirality center because it has three identical things. For this carbon atom right here, we can see two of his bonds, so that means it has two bonds to hydrogen. And again, because it has two identical things, that cannot be a chirality center. And our other um, CH2, this guy over here, that one also can't be a chirality center. So we've narrowed it down to the, just this guy right here. That carbon atom in the center, it has one hydrogen, it has one bromine, and then um, in terms of the other parts that, uh, that are attached to that carbon, it has two ethyl groups. And those two are identical to each other. The thing on the left is exactly the same as the thing on the right. And because of that, that carbon is not a chirality center either. This molecule has none. Let's try over here. So first we've got all of these carbon atoms. We're just gonna start by identifying all of our carbon atoms. Uh, now I want to eliminate this carbon atom and this carbon atom because they are parts of a double bond. In order to be a chirality center, you have to have four single bonds, zero double bonds. So these guys cannot be chirality centers. Now let's think about our hydrogens. We have on the ends of our carbon chains, we always have three hydrogens out there. So those two cannot be chirality centers because they have three hydrogens, three of the same thing. This guy right here, two hydrogens. And this guy right here, also two hydrogens. So again, here's another molecule that has no chirality centers at all, none. We've got a couple of more. Let's take a look at this one. First, let's find all of our carbon atoms. They all are single bond carbon atoms. So they're all, um, they're all initially good. On the end here, we have a CH3, a carbon with three hydrogens, so that can't be one, and same with our carbon on the other end of the molecule. For our next carbon right here, that carbon atom has only one hydrogen, so that's potentially a chirality center. Let's look at exactly what is attached to this guy. We have one hydrogen, we have one OH, we have this, um, a methyl, and then we have all of this, whatever we want to call this. Um, those are four totally unique things. So this is meeting the, the rules, the criteria for being a chirality center. Now, one thing that some students kind of um, get confused about is that they'll say, okay, so this is a bond to a carbon, and this is also a bond to a carbon, and carbon is the same as carbon. So how could this possibly be a chirality center? We're not just looking at what atom is directly attached to the chirality center. We're looking at the whole entire everything that's attached. We're looking at everything all together. So let's take a look at our next guy over here. This carbon atom also has one hydrogen. It has one hydrogen. It has one OH. It has all of this, which is not the same as the stuff over on the right-hand side. There's a chlorine on the right. There's no chlorine on the left. So because of that, this carbon atom is also a chirality center. It has four unique things. And the last one that we're looking at here, this is a carbon, it has a hydrogen, it has a chlorine, it has a CH3, and then it has this portion of the molecule. All four of those things are unique. So this molecule has three chirality centers, those carbons that are, are still in um, the, the pink dot. 
We've got one more molecule that we can look at. Potential carbons are right here. I'm not even going to mark that carbon with the double bond because there's no way that it's a chirality center. Uh, on the end here, our carbon on the end, that's a CH3, so this guy is also not a chirality center. This carbon on the other end of the molecule, also a CH3, can't be a chirality center. Here are two hydrogen atoms on that carbon, so this one also can't be a chirality center. We're left with this carbon atom. It has a bromine, it has an OH, it has a CH3, and then it has all of this. So those are four unique things, and this is a chirality center. Another thing that we'll be doing with chirality centers is practicing drawing in antiomers. An antiomer is just a fancy word for mirror image. So we want to be able to draw the mirror image of our molecules. And there are a couple of different ways that we could draw mirror images. One way is that we could literally think about a mirror and draw a mirror image. So maybe we imagine, like let's imagine that there's a mirror located right here. And on the other side of the mirror, we want to draw the mirror image of this molecule. So I'm gonna draw it. Oh, my software got a little goofy there. Um, working away from the mirror. And so I've got these points that are mirroring each other, these points are mirroring each other, this one right here, and notice that I've got this wedged bond, I need to have that in my mirror image as well. This bond out here got really wiggly, I'm going to straighten that out. So one of our options is to just literally imagine a mirror and draw the mirror image. And we can imagine the mirror in any place, so we could say, what if there's a mirror down here, how would we draw that, what would that look like? Um, I think I have to give myself a little bit more room. It would look like that. So there's the mirror image. This molecule is the mirror image of this molecule. And that means, I think I'm, I think I'm missing a carbon. Yeah, I'm missing a carbon. That means that this molecule is identical to this molecule. Um, could we show that? We could show that. Look, they are the same. Pretty cool. Um, so yeah, we could put the mirror anywhere. We could put a mirror over here and draw the mirror, mirror image on this side. That, that's no problem. So this is one way that you could go about doing it. Another way that you could draw an enantiomer or, or a mirror image is to change all of your wedge bonds into dash bonds or vice versa, change your dash bonds into wedge bonds. If you're using this strategy, you don't want to actually mirror anything. You want to leave all of the bonds in the exact same spot and you wanna make sure that everything is pointing in the exact same direction. The only thing that you wanna change is turning the wedge into a dash, a dash into a wedge. If you're using this particular strategy of just turning dashes into wedges, you are still using the mirror strategy. Um, in just in this case, your mirror is right here like that, like sitting on top of the molecule. So you're drawing the mirror image like this, like the molecules stacked on top of each other. That's a little harder to visualize. So over here for this molecule, let's do both ways. Let's imagine that we have a mirror. I'm gonna put my mirror right here. If we have a mirror, then we want to just literally mirror the molecule. So that means that we leave our wedges as wedges, we leave our dashes as dashes, it's gonna look like that. Um, or our other option would be to draw the molecule in the exact same way, but change our wedge for a dash or change our dash for a wedge. One thing that you are not allowed to do is mix and match those rules. So if you're going to draw a mirror image, this has to stay a dash. You can't turn it into a wedge. If you're going to leave the molecule completely alone, not draw a mirror image, then you absolutely have to change the wedge and the dash, but you can't mix and ma match those two methods. Uh, so pick the one that you like the best and go with it. And the last problem that we're going to do here, oh, I guess there's two problems um, about this molecule. This is the Zoloft molecule, a trademark name, um, generic name, Sertraline. This molecule has two chirality centers in it, and we're going to find those. First thing that I'm going to do is just identify all the possible chirality centers. So that's going to be meaning that I'm going to just find all of the carbon atoms in the molecule. I'm just going to mark every single carbon atom in the molecule like that. Now what I'm going to do is erase all of the carbons that are part of carbon-carbon double bonds because they cannot be chirality centers. And now we've got it narrowed down to just the carbons with single bonds. Now we can start eliminating carbon atoms that have, that don't have four different things. Our CH3 there, that's got three hydrogens. That's not a chirality center. 
This carbon atom right here, it has three bonds that we can see, so that means it has one bond to hydrogen. This guy up here has two bonds to hydrogen, so it's not a chirality center. Same with the one next to it. And this last one, one bond to hydrogen as well. Um, and since we're looking for two chirality centers, I mean, we just found them without even really having to analyze uh, what's on these carbons. But let's go ahead and do that anyways. This carbon atom has a hydrogen. It has uh, a nitrogen CH3H thing. And then this carbon atom is part of a ring. It's part of the same ring. When a carbon atom is part of a ring, it still can be a chirality center, obviously. We have to look at um, is the left half, or in this case, the top half of the, of the ring exactly the same, or is it different from the bottom half of the ring? The top half of this ring is not the same as the bottom half of the ring. And in that case, we do consider these as two unique bonds. Same with our other um, chirality center. We have a hydrogen. We have all of this that's attached. And then we have the top half of the ring, which is different from the bottom half of the ring. There are four different stereoisomers of the Zoloft molecule. We can use wedge and dash notation to draw all four of them. So if you're asked to do a problem like this, um, I so the wedge and dash notation, first of all, it applies only to the chirality centers. I'm gonna start by drawing the molecule just in regular line structure. So I'm not gonna add any wedges or dashes yet. I'm gonna save that. I'm just gonna get the whole molecule traced out and we want to include those hydrogens on our chirality centers. That's gonna be important. And so what I'm gonna do here, at once we get this all traced out and these are my chirality centers, we are going to pick on the first chirality center, the one on the left, we're gonna pick a bond, literally any bond we want, and we're gonna make it a wedge bond. Just gonna randomly pick one. And then once we have picked a wedge bond and made it a wedge bond, we are going to pick one of the bonds next to that wedge. So it's either gonna be this guy or it's gonna be this guy, our choice, just can't be this guy, can't be the one opposite. We're gonna pick one and we're gonna make that a dash. So each chirality center is going to get one wedge, one dash. And let's do the same thing with this guy over here. Pick a bond, any bond, your choice. Make it a wedge. And then pick one of the bonds adjacent. Make that one. Oops, I erased too much. Make this one a dash. That's one of the stereoisomers. There are a total of four, which means that there are four different ways to draw these wedge and dash combinations. So another possibility of this molecule over here, what if we just reverse the wedge and the dash? So we've put a dash here and put a wedge here like that. Another possibility would be what if we reversed it on the other carbon. So change this wedge into a dash and vice versa. Here's a dash, here's a wedge. We've got one more possible structure. The last possible structure is going to be the enantiomer of this structure. So the, in the, when I started with this structure and I went to this structure, I said, let's just pick one and swap that around. What if instead we had picked this one and changed, um, changed its stereochemistry, swapped it around. So we'll do that over here. We will have the left nitrogen be a dash and the right hydrogen be a wedge. We'll leave the other one the same. So there's our four structures. Now, only one of these four enantiomers or stereoisomers is actually the active ingredient that is marketed as Zoloft. And if you go onto the internet, you will be able to find the true structure of the Zoloft molecule with the stereochemistry correct. The best place to do this, in my opinion, is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is going to give you a, if you just Google, uh, if you go to Wikipedia and you just search Zoloft, or if you, even if you just type Zoloft into Google and then come up with the Wikipedia entry, you'll be able to see the true structure of the, of the molecule and figure out which one it is. Uh, and actually I can just do that right now. Let's just do that together. So if we go to Wikipedia and we're going to type in, I'm going to type in sertraline, might have better luck that way. 
Um, look at there's the structure of sertraline. Now it isn't showing those wedged bonds, uh, or excuse me, the dashed bonds, but it's showing us the wedge bonds, which is enough. So we're looking for the isomer that has two uh, wedge bonds, a wedge bond to the nitrogen and a wedged bond to that other benzene ring, which looks like it is this structure right here, the wedge bond to the nitrogen and the wedge bond to the benzene ring.